So I want to start right where we left off on Monday. We had established that in the market, especially once a routine um, exchange of goods established in the market, people make commodities or when you get to that part of capital represented by the letter C, and they go to market and there they can exchange in an equivalent exchange what is what this desk here signifies for an amount of money. So what the debt here shows is that the same value is present on each side, on both sides of the equation, here in commodity form and here in money. And we've established that this is a process that people have practiced over millennia. There is an established value that we attach to things that Mark says appears random, but once scientifically analyzed by Adam Smith, turns out that the basis for the value is labor time, the socially necessary average labor time. So what that means is that once you have a routine established marketplace in a society, pretty much anything can be brought to market and sold. And of course, um, you know, then you will also find other things for sale in the market. So you can go and sell your commodity in exchange for money and you receive um, another commodity in return. And the equivalence means that you get your money's worth. The, the money simply steps in. The value inherent through the labor process in the commodity momentarily takes money form and then it is reconverted into commodity form. And assuming that you're making things in order to sell them so that you can buy things you need from people who made them to sell them, then this value is going to be consumed. So you live off the product of your own labor, you get to feed yourself, you get to meet your needs, and everybody does that. And this is how production, exchange, and consumption in a society is organized in this market-mediated fashion. There are other ways that you could imagine, you know, somebody going around and collecting the harvest at gunpoint and then dishing it out one bowl at a time to the peasant. But um, that is, in other words, this is not the only way in which you can exchange, produce, and um, consume things, but it is a specific way where the rules and the basic assumptions that equivalents are being exchanged is foundational. So um, if you, however, enter the marketplace as an owner of money to begin with, um, and we don't need to exactly establish how you got to be that, but you have some money. You can go to market and you can buy a commodity. And there, um, you have this commodity now, and it is worth exactly your money, and then you can sell it again. What have you gained? Nothing, because you have as much money before as you had in the beginning. After all, this dash here signifies what is an equivalent exchange. So same value here, here, and here. But we don't want to have as much money after as we had before. We want to be capitalists. We want to make more money. We want to spend money in order to make more money. What we want is this amount here to be M slash, where M slash equals the original amount of money M plus the difference of delta M which is the more money. So the resulting M slash here is not the same as M. It is rather M augmented by delta M to make something more. So if you do that, what is the problem? The exchange cannot be equivalent anymore. There is something here where it doesn't work that way, right? Because 
the result of the process cannot be more than the beginning of the process. So that foils our nefarious scheme of getting rich by buying and selling things in the market. But that is what merchants do. How do they manage to do that? Why it turns out that merchants in the Middle Ages, in the early modern period, go and look for goods that require um, transportation in order to become available in the place where they will sell them and or that are cheap at the point of origin and um, not cheap, expensive at the point where they sell them. So you actually buy the commodity at a price below value if you go and acquire the spices um, in the in Indonesia, you know they're plentiful. You still the people there sell them. They're still doing well, but we can mark that up by a lot, and we can do the arbitrage process. We engage in a non-equivalent exchange. Um, nevertheless, between the merchants and the different empires they work in. Of course, they're going to compare notes. So there is a price setting uh, mechanism in place. Here. Price uh, a determination you can just arbitrarily sell it. Nevertheless, this is not, in fact, something that we can do as a routine operation in a capitalist marketplace. Yeah. So with like the labor theory of value in this, uh -huh. um, if the merchant is selling the commodity at a higher price than it took for the actual for him to improve the commodity, right? Are we saying that he's like stealing the money essentially for himself? Well, where is the money? I mean, the, the money that he gets paid is not actually being passed on to the original owner of the commodity, to the producer, right? So he gets to pocket that. And he gets away with that because it is precisely not an exchange where the labor theory of value would apply. Um, it is something where they get the, the good for less than it's worth. Um, and they sell it for more than it's worth. And this, the ability to do that disappears over time. In the 19th century, there comes a tipping point. Um, and I'm showing that in my dissertation that you can buy uh, on Amazon or directly from Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. It's in paperback. I'll sign it for you. Um, <laughs> there comes a point when the merchants that I study really can't do their own business model anymore. And that's because in the uh, economy now, the, the standard of doing business is set by industrial manufacturers. And so that sets the, uh, the prices and you have transactions where you can't um, uh, you know, avoid comparing directly your price to that of other people. So it becomes, the, the equivalent exchange becomes a reality and merchants lose their business model. And then they have to do business under different conditions. There is a role for merchant capital in an industrial work market too, but it's fundamentally different from the role of the traditional merchant capital in the early modern period, although, and that confuses things, it is in some cases the same companies and sometimes the same people, you know, who still carry on that business under the same name. And they'll talk a lot about tradition. But that's one step further, because this is not, and historically we see this is not a model for a successful capitalist business, because you lose the ability to do it the more fine grained and all encompassing the world market becomes. No more arbitrage, except in increasingly rare cases. So, what we still want, however, is to spend money in order to make more money. So, what is what we are looking for is, in fact, that we want to find a way to exchange equivalents and yet have something of more value in the end. If only, wait, if only we could find a commodity with a use value that allows us to do that because we have the commodity, we get to use it. Maybe there is something there. So here is the solution to the, to the problem. The capitalist actually exchanges his money for two different things. 
both of which are commodities. One is the means of production, factory, machinery. Um, the other is labor power. And this is something that becomes available on a free market historically, as guilds are dissolved, as serfs are freed, as slaves are freed, as traditional economic uh, situations where people work as dependent laborers are dissolved. And suddenly you have a labor market where people sell their ability to work for a temporary duration for a certain amount of money. So labor becomes a commodity that can be bought. And as the end result of this process, where you bring the means of production together with the labor, you get a commodity. And that commodity is, of course, the property of the person or company that does this whole process here, right? This is basically happening inside the factory, inside the corporation, output, one commodity. Now you go to market and you're doing another equivalent exchange. And lo and behold, as the result of that equivalent exchange, you receive your M slash. That is to say, you do actually realize your goal of making money by spending money because what you have in the end is more than before. And the difference delta M is what you have. How does that happen? Well, the reason it works is because this is a commodity with special power. Labor, after all, creates value. And so the value that is the result of this process is the value created by the labor. And because the laborer has no claim to the product of the labor, you get to sell it. Yes. What is the means of production? So we know that labor, that's a labor, that's like the pay, yeah. right? That's how much you get paid in that. Uh -huh. right? Correct. So what is the means of production? Back to the factory, the machinery, so that was the material, all the stuff that is needed. Or you could also say if for some reason the person who's hired to work had these things, they wouldn't have to hire for work. Because if they have a machine at home and if they can but money for the material, they can make their own yard of it. So, but people don't have that. In fact, the making of a free class of wage workers who are legally free to enter into contracts to hire for wages is also the process historically by which this class of people is freed from the means of production. In other words, they're kicked off the farm, the enclosure makes their business, the farm uh, non-tenable, the increasing pressure from industry puts their workshop out of business. All the small traditional ways of producing things are made obsolete. So then the people who carried on that business end up as um, sellers in the market, no longer of flood, but of their own labor. So the next question then is how exactly does it work if you have labor as a commodity? Do all the determinations of the commodity apply to it? Can it be bought and sold? Does it have a use value and an exchange value? Um, yes, absolutely. So when you look at the commodity label, let me make some space here on this. Where is this? There's one point here. You have now this special commodity that is labor. Like every commodity, it has two um, aspects. One is the use value and one is the exchange value. What is the use value of labor as a commodity? Yeah. It can use the means of production to make something more valuable than it was before. Yeah. To produce things that have value. So there's a certain amount of value um, that is produced by 
labor, and that is the result of this production. When the labor is um, engaged in doing its thing. That doesn't affect questions that pertain to the commodities produced by labor that might affect you know, their marketability. All the stuff we said about commodities earlier naturally applies to them too. So the sandwich that falls down, the machine that doesn't get sold. But the point is, you must hire somebody to make the commodity for you if you want to have the commodity. It's still not a guarantee that you're going to make a sale um, or that it's going to be lucrative to do so, but you need to hire the worker. And in that process, that worker produces the value for you that is expressed as another commodity. See that you then hopefully sell. So, but the commodity of labor also has an exchange value. What's that? Wages of the worker? Yes, exactly. That is what the exchange value is expressed. You receive a wage. Um, so that is a different value. Let's call that value two. And that is what you receive from your employer as your wage. When you buy a commodity in your regular exchange, commodity money commodity. What is the expectation that you pay for the commodity? What determines the value or exchange value of the commodity? Mm -hmm. The labor time spent. Yeah. So, and that if labor power that you buy on the market is a commodity like any other, mm -hmm. its exchange value would be determined by what? You'd think so, but that comes to the use value question. Like the, the, how skilled somebody is, that is a question of the use value, of what specifically they can produce. But exchange value for any commodity is defined as the amount of labor required to make that commodity, right? So same for labor, for labor too. The measure of exchange value is what is the amount of labor required to produce this commodity. Doesn't matter that it's a spe special kind of commodity with the value making superpower, it's still a commodity. And you know how much labor is required to make sure that you are in the market selling your abilities. What is required? A number of things are required. First of all, the commodity labor um, doesn't come without the human uh, form. And that human body is produced in a biological process. After which, the person who will eventually become available as labor power must be nurtured, taught, kept safe, loved, um, entertained, all those kinds of things. And that takes quite a bit of time depending on how your society feels about child labor. It can be six years, it can be 16 years, it can be 25 years before that newborn baby has morphed into a skilled worker who is now standing in the marketplace, in the labor market, able to sell their unique um, skill set, the labor power and hoping that somebody will buy it. So here is one thing that goes into making this value. It is sort of a lifetime thing. There is one amount um, over the lifetime of a person. And of course, they tell you, what's the cost of raising a child up to college these days? Like $3 trillion or something like that, it seems. Um, so there's that. What other things do you have? Expenses over your lifetime. There is, of course, your, ex college, your college expenses. Um, there is, if you read the New York Times, you can expect to spend about a half million dollars on your wedding party. Um, 
unless of course you charge people to attend mm -hmm. um which is increasingly common and then you know you have all those kinds of things that you really need to do basic things that need to happen for you to have that kind of skill and to be there as a human and of course it's a limited duration your availability is limited by your physical lifetime out of perhaps 50 to in rare cases 80 years of productive work during your lifetime but in most cases it will not be that much at least you would hope so so say that you spend 30 or 40 years um, at work now your life is hopefully going to be a little longer than that right so you have like say 80 years of life 30 years of work and then um that leaves me with an unsolvable mathematical issue because I can't do this fraction but um the the point is that's not it you know if you do a budget forget about monthly and annual expenses what really gets you is the weekly ones because that recurs so quickly if you have to spend 250 dollars on your grocery bill it's a thousand dollars in a month if you go and buy coffee for five dollars each day times say 20 days that you're actually out there um that is uh, 400 dollars. so all of that stuff amounts to something you have rent to pay the car costs insurance repairs so if you do budget you know but at the end of the um, money, there's usually still quite a bit of month left. And that way, you also can say there's like monthly expenses. And those you have to do times 12 to get your annual uh, cost times the number of years that you think you're going to be around for. So you have your weekly, your daily, your monthly, biannual expenses. And all of that, there is a definitive amount it's the definitive sum. It depends a little bit on what kind of work you're doing. You know, if you're going to spend 10 years pre-med, medical school, residency, specialty, and so forth, and then, and then you really need to find people who can pay you so much that because you expect the upkeep of your BMW to be part of it, you know, you're going to be a doctor with specialty skill, for instance. There's a cultural expectation that that's part of it. You do not expect to have um, a beach mansion um, in on the Pacific if you are a plumber someplace, for instance. That's a cultural thing. Why the doctor gets to have one and a BMW and the plumber doesn't. There, ha there is some sort of you know cultural aspect there, the valuation of certain types of labor. Nevertheless, at any given point in time, it is known, and there is a social average standard of what you think somebody in that line of work should be living. So when somebody says, as a professor, I make $4,000 each year teaching these classes, I have to cobble together, um, people will be shocked and think, well, that can't be right. You know, um, That's not me. But in other states, where they don't have a union contract, that is how people but um, either way, there's a, there's a known sum in the end where you can say this is the lifetime um, cost of the labor I need to withdraw from the big social pool, all the needs I have, where I need to ask other people to give that stuff to me to meet my needs. There's one sum, and you divide that by these years you Actually, you do not divide them, my bad, you do not divide it by the years you live. You divide it by the years you expect to work. And then that is what you need to get as your annual salary. And you can divide that by 12. And then you know um, what the value is. Your name. That is the exchange value. And here is the thing. Um, for the analytical purpose, Marx assumes that capitalism works like this, that everybody gets paid at value. That is an assumption to make to see how the system works when it works as designed. And if it weren't like that, we wouldn't have half the problem. The problem is, of course, that many people get paid under value. So 
especially in the services industry, when it comes to retail, um, hairdressing, all that stuff, like burger flipping and so forth, people do not get paid at value. Um, they do not get to actually meet their lifetime needs doing that work. It's not a job that will furnish them with a livelihood. So when companies like Walmart assume that the people they employ will go from their payroll office straight to the um, welfare office or get you know applications in for food stamps, that is an acknowledgement that they're not paying for the needs of the people they employ because they can get away with it. Government will fix that by, by providing the difference. And if government does it, wants to do that rather than intervene at the source, um, then that's a policy choice. You could say, you know, you must unionize, you must pay a living wage. But we're not assuming that this is not working as designed. We're assuming for the sake of argument that this is working perfectly. And the person who works gets as their exchange value exactly the value of their labor which is to say they get to meet all their lifetime needs at a decent standard. You know, BMWs for the doctors and everybody gets to have vacations, you know, like in basically Scandinavia. You um, <laughs> get a sauna in your backyard and a, and a moose, a pet moose possibly, I don't know, um, magical pet moose in a, in a fjord. So, what happens with that money? What happens with this value, with, the, with this share of the value produced day in, day out by the workers in a country, paid out to them as wages in exchange for the actual value of the labor power? It is, of course, spent. It is all of it spent. That's the point. I mean, you might save up some on the side and give some to your grandkids when they visit. But the point of this really is for it to be spent. What about this chunk here, though? The value, the completely distinct animal. This is the value that is withdrawn to feed and take care of the needs of the workers. This is the value that the workers produce in that same time period. And they have nothing to do with it. So in order for capitalism to work, of course, this here has to be much larger. This is not a, an arrow, but it's a larger than some. So the value produced by labor must exceed the value consumed by labor or the value of labor. And guess what? Without the form of labor and value in being involved, it is a fact of life for humanity that what we need to withdraw from the big pool always is going to be less than what we produce and add to it. How do we know that? Because our species is still around after many thousands of years. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be. So the source of culture, civilization, innovation, and all the good stuff, morality, religion, is of course that there's always a social surplus. Natural disasters notwithstand, you know, if it gets wiped out um, by natural disaster and warfare, that's that. But under stable conditions, the society has more than what it needs. As the result of this labor that creates value. So what are they going to do with that surplus? There comes a point where they can afford to have one guy to sit around and make laws and enforce them. Then perhaps to hire people to go and ride out with him on conquests. Then even before that, you can afford to have one person in charge of simply appeasing the gods so that the harvest will come out. So you get religion, you get government, eventually you get scholarship, um, and all the good stuff. And then eventually, you know, at the pinnacle of it all, TikTok influence. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is like, yeah. Isn't that a description of basic superstructure? Kind of? Well, you would say that the 
jobs were called for, you know, by the increasingly complex division of labor and enabled by that, sure. Yeah. But I mean, this model of civilizational development is fairly universally accepted. I mean, that this is how humanity emerged from tribal to, to modern standards, right? Um, if you look at, at the at Mesopotamia, um, agriculture, abundant surplus production, law, government, morality, you know, well, literature and stuff. So that's the thing, but what's the difference here between a capitalist and any other society? You always have a certain amount of value consumed by the people who do the work. You always have a larger sum produced in the same time. There's a surplus involved, a surplus value. The surplus value is the difference between the value of the product of labor and the value of labor. So this surplus value, which is a social surplus, um, that exists, like I said, in any society. And in any society, the question is, whose is that? Who gets to have their hands on that? And who gets to make the call? What do we do with it? Um, it might be that this is decided by priests, kings, you know, that kind of thing. It might be in a tribal society that is just left to the, to the um, tribal council or what have you. In a capitalist society, surplus value by law and by universal uh, you know, acceptance of the fact belongs to the owners of capital, the ones who bought the labor power in order to make commodities. Because the commodity that comes out of the factory that you own by way of the labor you hired is yours. And then when you sell it is when you realize the surplus value. The moment when these commodities hit the market is when the surplus value is becomes a real thing. And who owns that? The person who sold the commodity. So this is another way of saying, from when Marx says, the capitalism is characterized by the private appropriation of surplus value. Um, private meaning the people who have the private property in the means of production. And what's the problem with that? Well, it is a contradictory process because what we've seen is that the existence of such a thing as surplus value is a function of the social division of labor. It is therefore a faculty or trait or whatever a factor of life of a society, of all society working together that results in the existence of, at the end of the day, the surplus value. So it has a social character. Surplus value has a social character. Um, definitionally, it exists because of this complex social division of labor that involves gradations of competition to cooperation. But its legal form that contradicts its social character is one of private property. So the private appropriation of surplus value, which is a social thing, that's the basic contradiction of a capitalist society a source of conflict, a source of crisis. If you look at it in terms of class relations, what you would expect to happen if you have a perfectly working free market, as we are assuming here, for the development of the relative relations between classes, we would expect this class to stagnate at the level of their you know, at, at, at the level of socially available civilizational accomplishment. So they might still, they might have um, a tiled coal burning oven at one point and later on they'll have AC and then, you know, like central heat <laughs> rather than sit out in the cold. But that's a matter of the overall development of civilization and technology. But there is no sort of accumulation happening. Here, on the other hand, you have a group of people who 
start the process of day-to-day -day accumulation with the MCM part. So they have money that they put in. Why? Because they do not need to spend that money on their needs. They have money to spare. Else, you know, you can't become a capitalist if you need to spend the money, that's it. So they didn't need that money for their needs to begin with. Then it comes back to them almost inevitably, almost always, as more money that they then have the same problem with because now the next cycle of circulation, it's once more in M looking for its M stretch. So it is like a, um, an avalanche, a mushrooming thing. It needs to accumulate more and more. So that becomes the problem of this group of people, one that they seem to be only too happy to, to have to shoulder, but whatever social surplus there is, if left to its own devices, it'll start accumulating on this end, only among the small and increasingly smaller group of people. So that, at least, barring any interventions, is what you're supposed to, is what you're going to see happening. Um, but where, one might ask, is who, rather, is going to buy the commodities of tomorrow that are going to have to be more than the commodities of today because this surplus value, here, the amount of capital that is put into cap uh, circulation and real that has to grow day by day. <laughs> Where does that go? Where do we go with this? Who can buy them? Internally, um, the share of the productive output of society that this group here can pay for with their wages is not going to grow by the same amount. So before long, what you get is a crisis of overproduction and um, or underconsumption. Same difference. Again, even if everybody is paid at value, which they aren't in the real um, as we established. But therefore, once capitalism becomes the main way of doing business around 1800, you get global crises, I'm, I always get the first one, the date wrong, but I'm pretty sure about the other ones. In the 19th century, um, and about this interval, what do you, um, what do you recognize about that? Every 20, 25 years, roughly. Yeah. It's about a 20 year business cycle, a pattern that you get. And that is when um, the market corrects as it were, when the excess value that had been created, which can be sold, um, is simply discounted. And then at that point, companies that were overextended collapse, people go and become unemployed and you get a scramble to find a new starting point where you can um, enter the market to sell commodities that will allow you to make a lot of money. Um, so, and at that point, it is not just a matter of fancy stuff that is no longer sold. Because if so many people are out of work and everybody is holding on to their money, um, it will even affect staples, like basic things. And all economic activity is just going to come to a grinding halt. And it looks like... Um, it's never going to change. So these are shocking uh, moments in the 19th century. And people are struggling to explain them. And Marx is, of course, also uh, out to come to a theory of crisis and what happens then. So, but the, the basic is overproduction. And then what happens after that, mm -hmm. of course, 1929 is the big one, which is delayed because World War I manages to burn to a whole lot of people and labor products and machinery and stuff. Um, but so then, but 1929 is worse than before. And then when's the next one? 1987, about five years after the um, regulatory framework put in place under the New Deal is fully dismantled. In 1987, you get the savings and loan um, crisis. And then when's the next one after that? 2008. So we're back on the 20-year cycle. Um, 
And the next one should be, and this is, I'm not qualified to give investment advice, um, <laughs> but um, buy gold bars and stack them in a cave um, because it's coming by 2028. Unless, of course, you know, coronavirus, that was like, there was a little bit of virus communism there for a time. People were given money to, to live off, even though they didn't work. Less here than anywhere else. You know, here it lived, it was like to the, what, 1500 bucks or whatever. Yeah. And in European countries, I don't, I'm not going to tell you, I was going to start screaming. Uh, but, yeah. Um, so you're saying this like crisis of overproduction and slash underconsumption is a product of surplus value going to the owner class? Yes. Okay. That is the that is the legal form that creates that problem. Yeah. So if some of that surplus value was converted from the owners to the workers, would these boom and bust cycle not happen? Yes. I think that has the new deal legislation not been um, a deal that you could have gone even longer without. Probably, although of course you also had like political pressure, people saying we don't want this, and that in itself creates a problem. Yeah. Because our currency can go to extend the cycle? Not really. Uh, the money supply, I mean, there's modern monetary theory that claims it has something to do with it, but I've never heard them make an argument that I found even remotely convinced. Because money is representation of value, it has limits to how much you can finagle that, because the underlying facts of value are going to be asserting themselves one way or the other. Yeah. 